It's a real joy to be with you today and to share the Word of God. We have the wonderful privilege, Sharon and I, today of taking time with Oral and Evelyn Roberts to hear their story and what God has done in their lives. Thank you, Brother Roberts and Evelyn, for being with yeah. us. Well, it's a joy to be with you, Sharon and Bitter Joe. You feel more like our children since you're graduates of ORU and we're so, so close to you and your children and to Victor Christian Center and the schools. Evelyn, I feel very close to you. We sure do. It's like our children. We want to look back through the years and reflect on what God has done and right up until today what He's doing. When you were born, our country had just come out of World War I. We were headed into the 20s and the Depression years that followed the stock market crash in 29. And in particularly central Oklahoma was written as the Dust Bowl days by John Steinbeck. And in the middle of that, you were growing up battling all the elements that was there, including a very devastating disease. Well, one thing I don't remember is that when I was born, and on January 24th, 1918, was the worst flu epidemic in the history of a nation, and more people died with the flu in America than died in World War I. Wow. What I do remember are mostly the 30s, when Franklin D. Roosevelt was the president, and the Dust Bowl days, uh, when I was 17, I was struck down with tuberculosis, the disease of my mother's people who were part Cherokee Indian. Her father and older sisters had died with it, and it was in our family. And I was the one in our, uh, among the children that was struck down with it. And uh, those were days when people in Oklahoma were, were uh, selling out and going to California because they were not only the Dust Bowl days, they were in the worst depression days and uh, hardly anybody had any money. Uh, we were poor, of course nearly everybody was, so you didn't know you were poor as much as you do today because so many people didn't have anything either. And we'd see people take all of their household belongings and put on time on top of their car and head for California. And those were days when um, I was growing up and trying to find myself and to and to know what, whether I was going to live or die. And Evan was off uh, in high school and college and getting ready to teach school. Well, in the Dust Bowl days, I was in high school. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible time. My mother had to hang sheets over the doors and the windows to get wet sheets to keep the dust out of the house. We, you know, we didn't have no air conditioning in those days, so you had to have the windows and doors open. It was a terrible time. People had no money. But, you know, we always went to church. Our whole family went to church all the time from the time I was about six or seven when my parents accepted the Lord. We went to church all the time and served the Lord all during those days. And somehow the Lord provided for us, even though it seemed like today we didn't have any money. The first year I taught school, I made $40 a month and I lived at home with my parents and paid them room and board and used my dad's car to get back and forth to my work. And at the end of the year, I said, I can't teach for this amount of money because I have nothing left to buy even pencils, paper, or clothing for myself. So I gave up that job and went to Texas. And you know, it's amazing though, during all that time, how God was working mm -hmm. because I lived in Missouri Oral lived in Oklahoma, and I'd never heard of him, and he'd never heard of me. And God always has a plan for you, and you never know, it, you know, where it's going to lead. And at the time, of course, I had no idea, but we lived in Missouri, and we heard there was a, a Pentecostal school, Christian school in Oklahoma. And my dad said, I want our children to go there to school, and we're going to move to Oklahoma. That's how we moved from Missouri to Oklahoma. Otherwise, I never would have met him. And I had no idea who he was or where he was or anything of this sort. I didn't meet him until I had taught one year of school. And uh, let's see, I taught one year of school and was on this, I was, I was already in the, no, I hadn't gone to Texas yet to teach, but I was, had taught one year in Oklahoma. 
and I was staying out a year because I needed to have an operation on my feet and different things. And uh, when I went to a camp meeting, I met this young man. And when God spoke in my heart, this is the man you're going to marry, I began looking him over, sitting right beside him in a orchestra type situation in the youth service at a camp meeting. He had a guitar and I had a guitar. And I thought, well, he's exactly what I've asked the Lord for. He's tall. He's thin. He has blue eyes and black hair. You wouldn't know it now, but it used to be black. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Mine darker than yours. <laughs> I know it is, honey. I don't know why yours is coming in black. Mine is still white. But anyway, the Lord had this all planned out. And, you know, he has a plan for everybody, not just for us, but for everybody. If we follow those plans... He has a great plan for our lives, but I had no idea that this was God working all the, until he spoke to me. And when he spoke to me in my heart, then I knew my life was set. And I dated two boys while I was in Texas. Both of them asked me to marry them. And I said, no, I'm sorry. I don't love you like a person should who marries you. I love a man that I'm going to marry. And he doesn't know it yet. But I said, but I'm going to marry him. Oral didn't know this for two years. He yes, but you wrote it in your diary, and your mother told you something very, very funny. Yeah, she said, why don't you look at his mother? They were, we were staying at this camp meeting in tents, you know, we all had a tent. And uh, I said, I haven't seen his mother. He said, well, they're in the tent, third or fourth tent down. You should look at his mother. And I said, what do you mean? Well, she's a little short, fat Indian squaw. And I said, Mama, I'm not marrying his mother. I'm marrying him. <laughs> but God worked it out so that, and, and if you think back over your life and see how God works, it's, it's a miracle how he brings things together. And you never could do it in your life. You could never bring things together like he brings them together. And that's why I'm with this man today after 65 years, because God put us together. And when God puts you together, it works. Well, now, that I, I doesn't mean we don't, have, we don't have to work at it, because we do. We don't agree on everything. We have never agreed on everything. <laughs> but uh, I agree that if he's serving the Lord and following the Lord, I'll go with him. If it's his idea, just his own idea, I said, no, Oral, I won't go with you on your big ideas. But if it's God's idea, I'll go with you. <laughs> and it was two years before I knew that Evelyn had all these thoughts. We, we, we sat together and we introduced ourselves to each other. And I went on uh, about my preaching. I was a young man. And uh, two years later, uh, as I was coming 21, a friend of mine said to me, Oral, it's time that you got married. And I said, well, I agree to that, but I've not found the one that I feel God wants me to marry. And he, and he said, well, what do you want in a wife? And I said, I want ten things. He said, tell me about them. And uh, I knew them by heart, so uh, while we were driving down the highway, I was telling him about these ten things. He said, I know the woman. I said, where is she? Said she's teaching school in Rivera, Texas. And I said, I wonder how far that is. And I found out it was 600 miles away from where I was in Oklahoma. And I packed a little bag. And I had just been, been able to, to work and save enough money to buy my first car, a, a little blue Chevrolet coupe, brand new. Cost $622, I remember it like it was yesterday, and my mother said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Texas. What's down in Texas? I said, my future wife. I'm going to see her. And she said, well, if you're that serious, I'm going with you. And I said, Mama, <laughs> she said, I'm going. And so Mama got in the car with me, and we drove 600 miles and came up to the school where she was teaching and as I got out of this recess, and the little children uh, said to you, Miss Evelyn. Miss Evelyn, they've always called me Miss Evelyn. Everybody has. Miss Evelyn, your boyfriend is here. I had told them I was expecting a friend to come. 
and it was recess time. So uh, they, Miss Evelyn, they came, Miss Evelyn, your boyfriend is here. So I went out to the car and greeted Oral and his mother. And now remember, we had never known each other except I had seen him at this camp meeting, sitting by him two or three nights at the camp meeting and had never met his mother. I went out to the car and I, I uh, invited them in. I said, we have 45 minutes yet of school that I have to finish up and then I'll go with you. You're welcome to come inside if you'd like. And she said, well, let Oral go. I'll just sit out here in the car and rest. So she, he came in with me and it was story time and it was time to read us. We had a series of stories. I was reading to the children the last period every day. And I read that story and he sat in there with me. And when I listened to her read, it was the sweetest voice I'd ever heard. And I knew that I knew that I knew this, this was the one for me. I couldn't even remember what she looked like when we met two years before but I sure liked what I saw and heard in that schoolroom when she read to the children. 65 years. 65 years ago this past Christmas day. And he had just begun his ministry, I guess, a year or two before we met, maybe the year before we met in a camp meeting. You had just been healed of tuberculosis. Say a word a about or two that, Brother that. Roberts, about well, the healing because that's what birthed it all. That's, that's, what, that's what it was. I grew it. up at a time uh, and with parents who, who really loved God. My father was an itinerant preacher. He'd been a farmer and had, had never had great schooling. In those days, schools were far apart in uh, what was in, in Oklahoma just 10 or 12 years before. Oklahoma didn't, didn't become a state until uh, 1911. It was Indian Territory, you mean? I mean, Indian Territory, what did I say? You, I don't, you said Indian, but it was Indian Territory. Well, it was Indian Territory until 1911, and I was born in 1918. So uh, schools were far, far apart, and you were lucky to get a, a third or fourth grade education. And I grew up in a family without education, and that was the thing that I dreamed about. I dreamed of being a lawyer, it was very dear to my heart. And when I got up uh, 15, 16 years of age, uh, still in high school, I realized that through the poverty that we had in our family and in the area, that I wasn't going to get to finish high school because we stayed out of school the first six weeks of every fall semester to pick cotton. And uh, we picked cotton for the money to get through the winter to buy the staples for the groceries and, and, and our, our clothes. And uh, my family, we went to West Oklahoma where the cotton fields were, and we didn't get into school six weeks late. And uh, a wonderful thing happened to me uh, in the final year before I left home. Uh, I was in school there in Oklahoma and uh, in those days, the uh, teacher read your, your year's grade at the end of the year out loud before the class, and you walked up and got your report card and went back and sat, sat down. And I was kind of sweet on a little girl named, named Phyllis Delaney, whose uh, father had, dis had oil discovered on his farm and well, was known as a rich man in those days. And she was smart. And uh, the teacher called out for Phyllis to come forward as she had made straight A's. And I was still a stuttering boy. I was born a stutterer. And I had a tough time. I had no trouble with my grades if I could write it down. But if they asked me to stand up and to talk, then the words would stop in my mouth and it was really funny to the class. But it just broke me up, you know, and sort of drove me inside myself. And when she got to the R's, she said, Oral Roberts, would you come forward? She handed me my report card and she said, you have straight A's. And I had enrolled six weeks late and had made straight A's. And something happened in my spirit for the first time in my life through those straight A's that I had earned after being six weeks late in the, clack, in the school that I was, could amount to something. 
I could see down the road. I didn't know what would happen, but something good was going to happen to me sometime in my life. And the direction of my life, instead of looking down and being uh, feeling left out and, and uh, being down on myself, left me and I raised up my head from my spirit up and I was a different young boy until two years later at a basketball tournament where, where I was the center on our high school team. If we had won that tournament, we were going to the state tournament at the University of Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma, and I fell while making a layup and became unconscious. And my coach picked me up and put me in the back seat of his car and said, I'm taking you home. And when I got back to Ada, Papa called his doctor friends and they came to the house. And I remember it so vividly. They said, Ellis, they said to him, your boy has tuberculosis. And so that, in that day, there was no cure. It, most people who took tuberculosis died soon, within a year or two years. And I, I lay there 163 like days scene. until I went from 165 to skin and bones, 120. I was over six feet tall. You can imagine how I looked like a skeleton. And uh, life seemed to be over until my sister Jewel, who loved the Lord, and believed in God's healing power came in the room one day from another town and she just walked up to my bed and said seven words that changed me forever. Or oh, God's going to heal you. I said, is it you? She said, yes. And something went through me. And in a matter of days, my oldest brother came from another town where he had his family in a barred car and picked me up and dressed me and carried me and put me in the car. Said, there's a man praying for the sick in my town and God's going to heal you oral. And that man anointed me with olive oil, put his hands on me and asked Jesus to take this terrible thing out of my lungs. And the presence of God came into my body came into my lungs. And on the way, on the way there that night, I heard the voice of God. I'd never heard it, or maybe I hadn't had known. And he said, son, I'm going to heal you, and you're to take my healing power to your generation. And someday, you're to build me a university based on my authority and the Holy Spirit. And I said, God, if this is you, please say it again. And he did. I said, would you say it one more time? And he did, word for word. And I knew that I'd heard from God. I knew someday I would do those things, take his healing power to the world, and build God a university, which is out there on South Lewis, or Roberts University with over 5,000 kids, with you two graduates from the 70s. You know, I don't believe God gives diseases to people. I don't believe he makes them sick. I think sometimes he allows things to happen to us. Oral had 163 days to lie there and think about not being a Christian it, every day with his dad and mother praying, make my son a Christian, help him to give his life to Jesus. And he didn't do it. He wasn't interested at all until one night they didn't give up. They kept on praying. And I, and I would say to anybody, keep on praying for your children. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. They didn't give up. They stuck it out until finally one night they were praying and all of a sudden, he saw Jesus in his papa's face. And I think in any time you get a glimpse of Jesus, it's going to change your life. And he got a glimpse of Jesus in his father's face. And so God allowed that to happen to him so he would 
lie there and have time to contemplate on his life and what was going to happen to him. And God saved him that night and uh, soon after healed him. And it changed his whole life. His whole life changed. It's amazing how when you follow God, your whole life changes. But he could have rebelled against that. Or he could have rebelled against when God said, you're going to build me a university and you're going to have a healing ministry. He could have rebelled against that. But when you, when you do what God tells you to do. When you obey God. Yes, when you obey God, things happen that you never believe could happen. I had no idea when I met Oral Robertson that I was going to marry him that, that anything like this would ever happen. In the first place, I didn't know he'd ever had tuberculosis when I married him. No, you never heard me preach. I never heard him preach before. I never heard him preach. I just knew in my spirit he was the one for me. I knew it. I had not one doubt. And for two years I carried that in my heart. I dated other boys, but they never didn't mean anything to me. They were nice young men, but just didn't mean a thing. I was holding myself and waiting for that time when Oral would know that he was the one. And finally God let him know it after two years. <laughs> I Took still two know years. it too, darling. <laughs> you still know it? I do. <laughs> you, know, you know, those years that you walked out between being healed and the healing ministry exploded were preparation years, 12 of them. Yes. You pastored, you went to college, your family began, of course, and your marriage happened during that time. But there was something of a struggle going on on the inside of you. Well, the, uh, the Pentecostals were, uh, were among the few that believed in, uh, that God healed. But many of them uh, were not sure it was God's will to heal everyone, and, and they sort of believed that uh, at times God made you sick. And some of those people came to visit me and we would say those things, and that uh, was one of the reasons that I sort of paid no attention to what religious things was going on around me while I lay in, in, in that bed. But like Evan said, when Papa and Mama and the nurse came in my bedroom to pray for me to be saved, at, before which I had not shown any indication that I was interested, and saw Jesus in Papa's face, something really got inside me. And uh, pretty soon I have heard myself praying. But after my healing, and uh, I knew that I was called to preach. I don't know how I knew that but I just knew it. And uh, I began to travel with my father and uh, do little sermons every other night that these pastors would allow. You know, that if you were young and hadn't preached much, you didn't get, to pre get much preaching practice. But my father loved me and he would take me. But uh, there's this one thing I want to say here that comes to me very strongly. After my healing, I still was weak in my body. The, uh, they had sent off my, my blood to the, the medical laboratory in Oklahoma City uh, to have it tested after I was he healed, to be sure that the tuberculosis was gone. And my parents felt I should have medical proof that my lungs were healed, so they would no longer be afraid, you know. And uh, it came back, and the, the words were, no tuberculosis found. And that was a great day in my life, in my family. We all sort of celebrated. But right after I was healed, and, and my strength didn't come back quickly, so I had to take a nap every afternoon. I'd just lie down and I'd take a nap. And uh, I'd get, put on my pajamas and get in the bed, and, and Mama came in and said, Oral, don't put on your pajamas and get back in bed to sleep a little during the day. Just keep your clothes on, lie across the bed, because if you get under the covers with your pajamas on, the devil will come and try to make you think that the tuberculosis is coming back. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you just lie across the bed in your clothes and take an hour's nap or something like that, you'll just realize that you're resting to get your strength back. You've been healed, but you lost your strength. I couldn't even walk when I was prayed for to be healed. And uh, so, you know, it was, it was hard to get my strength back. And she said, uh, you'll get your strength back as you rest and start doing, doing a little activity and work. And I thought Mama gave me some of the best advice that I've ever received in my life, that all healings are not instant. Well, they may be instant, but the recovery time may take some time. She was dealing with the attitude of your mind. Pardon me? She was dealing with the attitude of your mind that she didn't want you to lie down on the inside, that, that you were just going to rest for the moment. And sometimes when people, like in her mind, if you got under the covers, it could mean that you would just go back into an attitude of mind of just laying back down in the sickness. Well, she could see me getting tuberculosis again and dying like her father had died at 50 years of age and her two older sisters had died. She could see what might happen to me again and she came against that. And uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to understand that you can get healed instantly but the recovery time may not be instant. It may take days or weeks or it, actually it took a year for me to get full strength that I had before I was sick. You were instantly healed. I was instantly healed by the pain and the hemorrhaging from my nostrils and the coughing and the fevers and, and the terrible stuff that, that goes with tuberculosis that destroys your body. The disease itself. All that was gone. Mm -hmm. I but had none of that. the recovery was 12 months. The recovery actually took. 12 months, though I was uh, began to be active after maybe uh, three or four weeks, uh, my, my strength began to come. This is such a good word for people recovering and from illness. You know, illness. Uh, what Jesus said to the devil when he was being tempted in the wilderness, he said, uh, you, uh, every, you live on every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, not just bread, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. After he was healed, his father spent days and days and days with Oral reading the word to him outside. In, in the days when we grew up, we had cane bottom chairs. I don't know if you all understand what cane bottom chairs. Well, we didn't have lawn furniture, but we'd take a cane bottom chair and go sit out in the shade in the, in the fall, in the shade, you know, in the summertime. His daddy would take him outside beside the house into old cane bottom chairs. And they'd sit out there and his daddy would read the word and explain it to Oral. Oral had a year of training under his father before he ever started preach. And that's what a lot of young people don't have. They don't have that nurturing, nurturing that it took. His, his mother was strong in her faith, but his daddy was steady. He was a steady man. He was he, into the word. Oh, he was into the Word, and he would read the Word and cry, and just, oh, I found something great in the Word. And he would teach that to Oral, day in and day out. And through that, I fell in love with the Bible, and I began to study it on my own. And though later on, in the university, I was allowed uh, to, uh, to, to, to take as much Bible as the Oklahoma Baptist University uh, in Shawnee, Oklahoma, uh, gave. And that was not an ordinary thing for a student there. That's why y'all were pastoring in that I was area. pastoring a small church in Shawnee, Oklahoma. I always tried to pastor where there was a college uh, because uh, I didn't get to go to college immediately because I got sick. And then I had to finish high school. I was still in, in high school. Uh, I hadn't, hadn't graduated when I became ill with tuberculosis, and I had to finish high school and then go to college. And uh, there they allowed me the privilege, and I took 60 hours in college in the Word of God. And I can tell you this about the Baptist. They have one of the best training systems in the Word of God of anybody who's in higher education. And my, my uh, teachers uh, had earned doctorates, and uh, they, they allowed me to take my uh, electives uh, in the Bible. 
And of course, there were required things I had to take later. But uh, I, I give them a lot of credit. First, my father, and then the Oklahoma Baptist University. The real critical point rose when you came to Enid. And something now, I went to Enid uh, burning inside later. Uh, I was called there to, to pastor a church, and also it had Phillips University, so I could continue going to school. But before that, Billy Joe, when we were in, uh, Fl in um, Georgia, mm -hmm. pastoring a little church down, that's when he had the first miracle happened. Uh, when he, uh, some man in the church, uh, his wife called Oral one day and said, Clyde Lawson. Yes, his wife called and said, Oral, Clyde has uh, dropped a motor on his foot. And he's sitting out in the garage just crying, and the foot's bleeding, he can't move his foot. Would you come and pray? And Oral said, of course. And he took one of his uh, deacons with him out there to pray. And the, she called the doctor, too. And I think they got there before the doctor did. And Oral just, what did you do, honey? Well, the uh, motor, he owned the garage. And the motor had dropped on his foot and split the shoe. And the blood was coming through the shoe and he was down on the ground and holding his foot in his hand and virtually screaming. I mean, he just crying so loud, you know, he hurt him so bad. And I stood there and I looked down and I just reached down and touched his foot and said, heal him, Jesus, and stood up. I didn't even know why I was doing it. And he stopped screaming, screaming. He pulled off his shoe, he stood up, he stomped his foot, he walked around, he said, Oral Roberts, what did you do to me? I said, I didn't do anything to you. I was as scared as he was. <laughs> I'd never had a healing other than my own in my life, uh, certainly not through me. And when we were in the car going back, the deacon said to me, his name was Bill Lee, who later became the first manager of my office I built in Tulsa, uh, where my headquarters came uh, 10 or 12 years later. Not, not 10 or 12, two or three years later. And he said to me, Oral, can you do this all the time? I remember what I said. I said, good Lord, no. <laughs> he said, if you could. You could bring a revival to the church. And that thing rang inside me. Revival is what we didn't have in those days. Maybe in a few little isolated places, but not on a general scale. Certainly not in my church and, and not in me. And uh, there, there were days of great poverty. Uh, the, the, we, we, we pastors lived on uh, 50, 60 dollars a week. Often we didn't have a place to live. And uh, we had to stay with, 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 with people, with our families. And of course we, we were so committed we'd do anything to preach uh, the gospel. But uh, that was a great word to me. You can bring a revival. If, if, if what he meant to say, if God would do th healing through you, and I live to see the day when some of that came to pass. I think it was one year or two years after that we went to Enid. Yes, to it, it was one year after that that we went to Enid and uh, to Phillips University, and my English professor, a brilliant woman, uh, took an interest in me. Uh, not in a religious way that I could tell, but, but she just was extraordinarily friendly to me, is what I mean. And one day out of the blue, she said, Mr. Roberts, you're interested in healing, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. I hadn't got into it yet. And she said, I think that's the thing to do. And I said, thank you. And I thought that was a rather wonderful word that came to me from a person that you'd never think would think in those terms. And that, those were days that I had a tremendous dissatisfaction and heaviness because the healing that I saw of Clyde Lawson was not being repeated. And there were, there were a lot of prayers for the sick 
but there was very few healings that at least we could see with our eyes and know about. And uh, they were what you'd call wonderfully saved people, good friends. But that was just not a high priority. Mm, kind of like in a lot of churches today. It's not that they don't necessarily uh, have unbelief. It's just that it's not a high priority in our theology. Once you've had something, a disease though, and you've been healed, you want everybody else to be healed. Mm -hmm. That's the way. And whatever God gave oral, he wanted everybody else to have it. All of his life, he's been that way. If God revealed something to him, he wanted to give it to everybody else. You know, he wanted everybody else to have it. And if they didn't take it, he'd get really upset. All of his life, he's been this way. If they didn't take what he offered, they, he would get really upset. He'd say, well, the Lord, Lord gave it to me. Why won't these people take it? And I said, well, honey, you have to give them time. You know, it took you time to get it. So it's kind of like my brother who was a, a real sinner boy. I mean, he was, he was into everything, about to leave his wife and everything. And when he got saved, gave his life to the Lord, he changed, uh, he was, he changed almost 360 degrees. I've never seen anybody change so drastically as he did. And then he was a barber, still is a barber in Tulsa. And he, and he came to me a few days later, he said, Evelyn, I just tell these people and tell these people that come to me to get saved and I can't get a one of them to move. And I said, G.W., how often did you move when they spoke to you before you got saved? He said, but I just want them to have what I have. I said, yes, I know. We wanted you to have what we had too, but you didn't accept it very easily. But that's the way Oral was. He always wanted people to have what he had. And if God revealed anything to him, he gave it to his people the first thing and he wanted them to receive it. That whole year in Enid, though, he was restless inside. Now, he, he had not told me, Billy Joe, up to this time, he had not told me that God had called him into the healing ministry. I knew that his life had something to do with the university because all those 12 years we traveled, every town we came to that had a university, we stopped. And he took a picture of Re Rebecca was a, just a baby, too, about two years old. And he took a picture of her and me out in front of this university. And he'd get out and say, now, I won't be long. Just stay in the car. I'm going to go look this place over. He'd go in and look, he'd look at their basketball court. And he would look at their chapel. The library. Your lot? And the library. And the library. Oh, he'd look the whole place over and come out and then he wouldn't, oh, that's a beautiful university, he'd say. And that's all. He didn't tell me that the Lord had called him to build one. He never told me. We kept looking at universities everywhere we would go. He was enticed to that university. But he didn't tell me this for a long time. And toward the end of the year that we were in Enid, when he got so restless that he got up at night and was reading the Word of God in the middle of the night and began walking in his sleep, which he had never done, I knew there's something going on inside of him that I had to find out what it was. And I said, Oral, there's something going on. I don't know what it is, but there's something going on, and you've got to tell me what it is. That's when he sat down and told me he was called into the healing ministry and to build a university. The Lord had told him. And... Uh, Right soon after that is when we had the very first service in Enid. For the healing of the for sick. For the healing of the sick. First service where, well, he, did you go before that time to preach in little churches around or was that after? No, that was the first uh, time, but uh, we went downtown and rented an auditorium because in the little church where we were, it only seated uh, 200 people and uh, I uh, put out some fleeces before God, and I said, Lord, if, if I th heard you like I believe I did to t take your healing power to my generation, I'm going to have to have some evidence. I can't get it in my church. I can't get it in myself. And so I said, uh, I'm going to ask you for a thousand people to come to this auditorium. And that may seem like a small number today, but to go from, uh, I had 150 people in that 200 seat church, to go from there in one day to a thousand people in downtown East Oklahoma, to me, looked, looked like it's in the next millennium. <laughs> and uh, 
Also, the second thing that I want, the rent on the building is $160. When we get up to, to uh, ask for the offering f to pay on the rent, I certainly don't ask anything for myself, but we have to pay the rent on the building. I don't want a lot said about it. There had been a minister come through Enid, Oklahoma, who sort of had a kind of a half healing ministry. Uh, but, uh, and he was a good preacher, but when he prayed for the sick, you, you couldn't see anything happening. And, and he spent so much time taking, taking up the offerings until Evan and I just got sick at our stomach. And uh, I said, I'm not going to have that, that kind, of, kind of thing in, in my ministry. If I can't trust God for the money, I don't need to be in it. And I said, uh, I'm going to have one of the pastors who, who's going to help sponsor me uh, tell the people what the rent is and uh, just mention it and say, 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 will you give? And I'm not going to say that word. And uh, that was the second fleece. And the third one, Lord, I'm asking you to heal at least one individual in such a way that they know it, I know it, and the crowd knows it. It has to be something of a nature that is outstanding. Those are the three things. Then I went down to downtown at the SQ Men's Clothing Store and got a job for the next Monday morning. That if this didn't happen on the Sunday afternoon before of this service, if these three feasts did not come to pass, I was going to walk out and uh, not be in the ministry anymore. And uh, Evan was very, uh, 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 you were beside yourself uh, by that. Well, everybody was in the church because we had told the church that if God didn't answer these three fleeces, Oral would be out of the ministry on Monday morning because if, if we couldn't trust God to do what we asked him to do, then why go on playing church? And everybody stayed that day. Nobody went home for lunch. Everybody stayed that day and prayed. We all prayed at the church until it was time to go to the meeting. Which was 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, yes. We got there and the caretaker met us at the door. And he said, Mr. Roberts, I understand you want a thousand people today. He said, that's what I've asked the Lord. He said, well, there are 1,200 already here. That was fleece number one. And then when they took up the offering, we got $163.03. So that was fleece number two. And then when he, after he finished preaching, he just jumped down off the stage, just kind of automatically jumped down off the stage, and people started getting, getting up and coming toward him. He didn't ask them to. He just stepped off the stage, and they began coming from everywhere. And one German lady came up and had him touch her, and she began doing this with her hand, like this, and she said, oh, look, look, look. I can move my hand. I haven't been able to move that hand for 38 years. And look, I can move my hand. And a lot of people knew her and knew she was telling the truth. That was fleece number three. Then he began praying for the people, and he prayed for those people. For I, everybody that came up who wanted prayer, he prayed for them. <laughs> until he was his, six o'clock, I think. His clothes were wet from the top to the bottom. Everybody had been prayed for that wanted to be prayed for, and I'm sure there are many healings we didn't know about. But the, one of the main things is that seven men who saw that first woman <coughs> get healed came up behind him and took hold of his clothes. And there were seven men whose wives belonged to our church, but they wouldn't come. They were not Christians, and they wouldn't come to the church with their wives. And they said, Brother Roberts, pray for us. We want to be, we want to accept the Lord for our Savior. So you see, healing brings salvation to people. When they see a miracle, it brings salvation to people. That's the end result of a miracle. And over the years, when I uh, started out then, I left India and started out in the healing ministry, and the people began to come by the thousands wherever I went. And uh, finally, we had a big tent to see 10,000 people. We had 10,000 folding chairs, uh, which we, because in those days, 
in 1947, 48, 49, 50, 50, and the 50s, there were not many big auditoriums like we have in America now. So we, we, we built our, our auditorium, this big tent, these folding chairs and, and all the stage and the lights and the, and the organ and piano and the big uh, semi-trailers, trucks and all to, to carry them. And uh, uh, among the people who came to be healed, for every person who came to be healed in the healing line, that is the line of people who come by and not lay hands on them, there were at least 10 who would come forward in, in a group to, to accept Christ. For every time I prayed for a sick person, 10 other people had had their hearts touched because when they saw a healing, they saw a miracle. And I, I prayed before everybody. Everybody that came would, would tell what was wrong and they could see if they were healed or if they weren't. They could see my failures, they could see the successes. And it touched their hearts. And my invitation to the unsaved were 10 times as many as came in the healing line. So healing goes right along with the preaching of the Word. Preaching the Word is the foundation. It's the main thing that you do. But Jesus taught that, that He would confirm it with signs and wonders. And the missing element in the body of Christ are the signs and wonders. However, thank God, there are thousands of churches today and thousands of ministers who are praying for the sick. And in my view, it's many times greater than the uh, 21 years that I was on the field in the uh, total healing ministry before I opened Dora Roberts University. One of the things that I understand was that whenever people came, in order to get a healing card, they had to attend a teaching time yes, in the, in afternoon. the afternoon. Yeah. And I know Bob DeWeese did that for a number of years for you. But there's a significance in people knowing what the Word of God says and being able to receive. Well, how did well, you... the, the, the main problem that, that, that I faced in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s was the fact that healing had not been preached very much. It was preached some, but in the main, it was not done. There was virtually no teaching, it was very small, on God healing people in our time. And I had to spend a lot of my time and then in uh, teaching the people that it's God's will, that you can be. You may not be, but you can be. And uh, I had a director of, of the Crusades, a, a powerful minister, who every afternoon then uh, would, 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 would re-echo what I had preached. And because the, the people uh, uh, coming were so many, I couldn't pray for the same number, I mean all of them the same night, because I didn't have the strength. It, it would take taken all night and all the next day uh, if, if I'd prayed for everybody who wanted to be prayed for. And uh, so you'd get a card with a number on it. And in consecutive order, those, those cards would be called so many each night. And you knew what night you were going to be prayed for. And then if I hadn't got to all of them within those days I was there, then on the last Sunday, they were lined up in quarter of a mile long lines like this, some eight and 10,000 of them. And I would go and lay hands on every one of them and pray for their healing. So nobody was turned away. How my body stood up to that, I don't know to this well, day. Well, it really didn't stand up to it, Oral, because you broke both uh, rotator cuffs in your shoulders, had to have them operated on. It, it uh, you know, Paul said in his writings that I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus in my body. And so do you. You bear the marks because your shoulders were, were lean. He, he was up on a high platform and the people stood in front, but they'd stand back and he'd have to reach out and pull them toward him each night. And for doing that 25 years with your shoulders, he broke these rotator cuffs. Uh, but that's just, you know, 
one of the things you do, you do whatever is necessary when you're preaching the gospel. As that was happening, God had been stirring you on the university, and you knew that day was coming. Well, I was telling the people in the latter part of my ministry on healing, the last 10 years of it, I mean by the last 10 years that I was publicly, I've, I've never ceased praying for the sick. I still pray for the sick. But I'm talking about traveling in what I call the big days. And I was telling them that God had told me to build a university, uh, an academic university based on His authority and the Holy Spirit. And the day was coming. And I'm sure they heard me, but they didn't hear me very well. But they did hear me. And uh, then as, as the time drew near, I, I knew that the university was getting near like a woman about to have a baby. Uh, it was incubating inside my spirit. And the time came in the early 60s when Eva and I sat down and I said, well, the, the time has come. And you remember how you felt the questions you asked me? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I always question him. Are you sure God told you to do it? And are you sure this is the time? And he said, this is the time. But he said, I don't know how to do it. I, I know it's the time, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. And that's when he started a real study on the Holy Spirit, like he had never studied before on the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, several people, Ralph Wilkerson was one who pr prayed with him and studied with him for a long time. And uh, They studied the Holy Spirit until Oral understood for the first time that you could uh, pray in the Spirit and you could interpret what God gave you. That was the first time he ever understood that. And uh, when it came time for him to build, he was walking out on the grounds. You know this story, Billy Joe. Walking out on the grounds when the Lord spoke to him and he started praying in the Spirit. Now, we had both prayed in the Spirit You're talking for many about years. In tongues. Yes, well, they call it talking in tongues when I was growing up, but actually it's praying in the Spirit. In, in um, Ephesians, I think it talks about, it's one of, the, one of the pieces of armor. The last piece is praying in the Holy Spirit, building yourself up in the Holy Spirit. And he was out there praying in the Holy Spirit uh, just automatically. It came up without his even thinking about it. And then finally he began to interpret what he said and he said, Lord, let me do that again because I've never done this. And the Lord let him pray again in the Spirit and then he began interpreting what he said. And the Lord gave him the picture of the university in color. Gave the whole picture of the university sitting out there in color. Instead of talking to him, he gave him this picture. And he came home and had his had an architect that had uh, built our first three buildings down there uh, to sit down with him and go. They had a big one of these, can it wasn't canvas, it's paper. These things that you have oh, stand on a stand, paper about this big, you know, you turn the pages over, I don't know what you call it, and a big piece of chalk. And Oral said, now, Frank, this is how I want you to build a university on this piece of paper. This is what God gave me. And he built that university on a piece of paper before he ever built it on the ground. He did that to the City of Faith, too. The Lord gave him the plans, and he did it on paper. The architect would keep putting drawings down there, and Oral would say, that's not it, that's not it, that's not how God told me to do it. And he finally came to the point where Oral said, that's it. That's what God told me to do. And he had the university built on a piece of paper. Then we made a little model of it before he ever built anything except the first three buildings out there. And we called this the um, people from downtown, Chamber of Commerce downtown, and had them come out and look at the plans. We had dinner for them one night and had them look at the plans. And they just shook their head. They just didn't think that a healing evangelist could ever do a thing like that. They had no idea. And I don't think there was one of them that believed it could be done. But it's been done, and there it is.
Brother Roberts, the university came up in a time when America was in terrific turmoil. What a time for a university focused on the Holy Spirit. It, it was like a counter move by God against everything that was happening the other direction. Well, the young people of America had rebelled against their parents and against the universities and against the government and uh, against the war uh, in uh, Vietnam and uh, the um, order of free love was, was spreading. They were burning down school buildings. Uh, I mean by that college, uh, locking college presidents in their office, offices. There was uh, an immorality that America had never had. And it was the worst time in the world outward to build a university, especially one built on God's authority. God had said to me, you're to build me a university based on my authority and the Holy Spirit. Well, most people didn't even know anything about the Holy Spirit. And authority was being rebelled against all over America. In fact, it was a dangerous time, period. And uh, we came in there with an honor code. We, we came in there based on the Word of God. We began to build with many academic people uh, telling us that a university based on such rules and regulations and, and on the Bible and what you call the Holy Spirit, Mr. Roberts, can't be done. And Tulsa certainly was not in a mood. Uh, I don't think they were against me as much as they couldn't see that it could be built. Uh, the University of Tulsa had been there for a long time and was very popular, and they thought that was enough. And what was I doing out there trying to build a new university in Tulsa where I had uh, been living a long time since 1947? And then across America, where I, my name was connected with healing, I probably, uh, based on my television ministry on 175 of the big stations, in the, uh, they didn't have cable then. They, they, had, they had the big stations from number two to 13. And I bought time on virtually all of them and brought the crusade uh, from the tent itself. I mean, you could sit there and see and hear me preach and see the healing line, see people heal right in front of your eyes. And the television program had caught on, I mean, across America. Whatever time it was on, if it was on Sunday afternoon, people would stop. If you came through town, you could see people uh, get up in the yard and go in the house to turn on the television set. It was a phenomenon. No one had ever been on television in that uh, dim dimension before in the history of the United States. So as I said, it was a phenomenon. And my name was known, the, uh, the, the, the media had, uh, had set their big guns on me, <laughs> and that was, to say the least, quite a little persecution. And uh, I had no money. I had no students. I had no faculty, I had no buildings, I had no land. I had a word from God. And most people believe that God didn't speak to you anymore. They didn't believe that you could hear the voice of God. And I wasn't uh, quite sure that I understood what I had been told, though I had clung to it for 30 years. For 30 years, I had carried those words, and not one word had changed. And now it was like the incubation of a baby coming up inside of me. I was pregnant, pregnant with this, and it was going to be born in, in some way. But my mind said there's no way. My mind, not just the minds of other people that heard me talk about it, uh, said it couldn't be done. My mind was saying it couldn't be done. The only thing I had going for me was my obedience. As you always said, that whatever God told me, at least I would try to, to obey. 
He never questioned God if God said do something or try to do it. He didn't know how to do it, but he'd try. He'd say, well, Lord, I don't know how to do it, but I'll try. And I remember saying to him, God, why don't you uh, ask someone to do this that uh, is already made, who, who, who knows what they're doing, who knows how to build? He said, I don't, don't want to do that. I don't want someone already made. I want somebody I can make. And he said, I'm going to let you build this university. And I'm going to let you build it out of the same ingredient that I used when I made the world. And in the Bible it says that God made the earth out of nothing. And I said, in other words, you let me build it out of nothing. He said, yes. And when I walked on those grounds that we had paid down on out there on South Lewis in Tulsa, alone, and much of that time, I couldn't keep the tears from flowing down my cheeks because I felt a, like the loneliest man in the world when he let me pray in tongues. When the tongues just came up in me, I had prayed in tongues a few, not prayed in tongues, but I had spoken in tongues a few times before, but not in a way that I understood. I knew it was real and I knew it was Bible, but I didn't have a lot of experience with it. And this just automatically came up where it felt like it was an automatic. And it was a beautiful language, one I certainly hadn't learned. And then when I stopped, I said, let me do it again, Lord. And up it came again. And it stopped. And here came this picture uh, called, what, which I called interpretation, not in words, but a picture. And I saw the money coming. And I saw the students coming. And I saw the faculty coming. I had made a decision that, that I would have at least 75% with earned doctor's degrees, which was a virtual impossibility because God said, I want each one of them filled with the Holy Spirit. And they just didn't exist in numbers from which I could choose the uh, numbers that we had to have uh, for, a, for a major academic university. And uh, no money no students, no, no faculty, and no academic uh, understanding. Well, I'd, I'd been to college and all that, but that's not the same as building, building a university. And uh, I saw the, the pictures. When I drive through the campus now with Evelyn, or with my son Richard, who's the president now, I often say, I saw this. I saw it was built. I saw it was real. I saw uh, all these students, not individually, but as a group, I saw them. I saw this faculty. I saw this activity. I saw the Holy Spirit building this through one man and his partners, the friends across America who, who had heard me talk about it. And I invited several hundred of them from time to time to Tulsa, and I'd present it to them. I'd present a little big part of a building to each person. Would you sponsor this? Will you take, take this as a project? And uh, they always did. And they believed what I said. And I knew when they believed what I said that they were not looking to Oral Roberts. They were believing that God had spoken in my spirit, had spoken in my heart. And they could feel it and they could see what it would do for their children. They didn't want their children part of that rebellion process that was sweeping through America, that immorality that was taking so many young people into destruction. They wanted a, a place of shelter and safety in which their students could go to class and where there'd be a prayer tower built in the midst of it, 200 feet high, where each professor really knew Jesus in a personal way and yet was brilliantly trained, and where that everything would be accredited in the high standards of American higher education. It seemed impossible, but they believed it. 
And as Evan said, we'd already built it on paper, <laughs> you know. It's, we sat there, drew it out on paper when we didn't even have the money to start on a building. But we'd built it inside ourselves. And I had uh, brought in some of the greatest educators in America. I've found a few with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Dr. John Messick, who was rated in, uh, in the top 10 educators in America, uh, came and uh, helped me with the academic, laid out things, and went to talk to, to the uh, accrediting people. And then the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, the Son of God, God made the difference. Those that didn't have the Holy Spirit, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and didn't pray in tongues, we led them through all those who were willing. And some of those who didn't have the PhD degree, who had a master's say, we would finance them to a, a university so they could come back uh, two, three, four years later and join the faculty. We, we, we built the faculty like we did the buildings, almost out of nothing. Evan, you were right in the middle of that. Well, we me. sent Dr. Carl Hamilton, remember, to Arkansas, to the University of Arkansas. He got his PhD. And yes, uh, uh, we had practically to help, help grow him up because he, he worked with me in the healing ministry first. That's right. And several others I remember you sent off to college to get their PhDs. And we finally ended up with, how many do you say we have there now? Well, we opened with a freshman class. And we had 33 professors that first year. 300 and, students. And 300 students, uh, as opposed to 5,000 plus now. And uh, those 33 uh, faculty members, 85% of them had the earned doctorate. And. Uh, miraculous. And. The word drifted out in the academic world what we were doing and what high standards academically we were beginning with. And uh, from an academic standpoint, that world looked favorably upon the way we were building ORU. And then we built the dial access system, which was the first one in the United States in higher education, where you could uh, uh, dial in a, a class say you were sick and you could dial in the class that you missed because we required class attendance unless you were sick or some emergency. And this dial access system uh, had not been built. And uh, we had the first one installed and pretty soon colleges were, universities were sending their, their leaders to our campus from all over the United States and Canada. And, and uh, then we started basketball and they began to win. Oh, they, they went to the final eight in 1974. And through that uh, helping, the next thing you knew, uh, in addition to, to the, uh, the television, uh, I built it right on television. Uh, the whole nation knew about Oral Roberts University almost overnight. Just recently, I was in the beauty shop and a lady came in and uh, she looked at me and she said, uh, excuse me, I just saw you sitting there and I was attracted to your white hair. And I said, oh really? She said, yes. She said, uh, where are you from? And I said, from Tulsa. She said, well, I thought your accent was different than it is out here. And I said, uh, well, my husband built a university there. And she said, Oh, yes, Oral Roberts University. I don't know him, but I know about the university. They didn't know him, but they knew about the university. Everybody knows about Oral Roberts University. Many of them don't know Oral. They don't know anything about him, but they know about the university. So it's been a, uh, a wake-up call, I think, for us, in a way, to wake up people to the, to the knowledge that there is a university in the United States of America that is high in academics and also has rules and regulations and the boys and girls have curfew, which you hardly ever hear of on any other campus. Build me a university, God said. So this was going to be his university. That's right. Yes, he said, university. build me a university, university based on my authority and the Holy Spirit. He said, I want you to raise up your students to hear my voice. 
to go where my light is dim, where my power is not known, even to the uttermost bounds of the earth. My voice is heard small. Yes, and my heart voice is heard small, and their work will exceed yours, and in that I'm well pleased. But, Billy Joel, there's one thing that's been missing throughout the world of Christianity, and that is the baptism with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, which we now know as the prayer language of the Holy Spirit with interpretation back to your mind. Your spirit originating words that God puts there in a special language that by your will you bring up over your tongue and you say to God. It's you talking to God. And then listening, getting quiet and listening for God to talk back through interpretation and hearing words from the Lord directly that's based upon the written Word of God. That became at the heart, as you and Sharon know when you enrolled there and finally graduated, that that is the is one of the if if not the major difference it's one of the major differences that when you interpret back to your mind it in, illuminates your mind it illuminated my mind without my praying in tongues every day from that time forward when I faced the impossible of getting the money to build buildings, for example, hundreds of millions of dollars. Sums of money that's hard to imagine when you had none to start with. Of getting a great piece of land, building superior buildings and facilities, of of having 64 majors with a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, doctor's degrees, of standing on the threshold of a new academic possibility in this nation, and yet having a campus where it seems like Jesus lives there, that he walks the grounds, that he visits the dormitories, he stands by the professors as they teach. And th those of us who were in the administration as we built and guided the school, and my son Richard and his wife Lindsay as they head the university now, and it's bigger now than it was when I was the president the first 30 years, and now he's in the his 11th year as the president. And 90% of the kids pray in the Spirit. And the chapels are alive with praying in the Spirit. And you feel the presence of God. Many people have never felt the presence of God that they know of. But it's virtually inescapable that you will feel the presence of God really just to walk on the campus. Now I'm not just talking, I mean, just talk to anybody. That uh, the, the, the people come to the, uh, uh, is it the hotel across the street? Yes. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they rent a room facing the campus and just, and just stand there for hours and look at the campus. Ministers, pastors come there and uh, revive their vision of what's in their hearts and they go back and do it. God is at Oral Roberts University. He's the head of it. The Bible is the main book. Though we have all the academic books that are required and some that we throw in extra. I mean, it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm really trying to give the glory to God and to thank Him that He, he picked on me. There are many times when we ran out of money and it looks impossible. And I'd come home to Evelyn and I, I, would, I would be in <coughs> tears and she, she would talk to me. You would talk to me and lift me up. 
Well, it looked impossible. Everything you did looked impossible. It looked impossible to start the university. It, it seemed impossible for you to start the graduate schools when you started. I remember when we were in Wyoming one summer and the Lord spoke to you and said, this is the time to start the medical school. And you called home and said to Jim Winslow, start it this fall, Jim. We've got to start Jim. And well, Jim said, Oral, this is not the time to start a medical school. Oral said, Jim, start the medical school. God said it's time and it's God's time. We started it. And it was the only time we could have started a medical school. We learned later. It was the only time in history we could have started a medical school. And we did. And it went uh, sorrowfully. We had to close it. But it went for eight years, nine. nine years. Well, we have 333 doctors graduated from out of there, and they're all over, all over the, world. the world. We have one that's right here in Hogue Hospital that uh, installed a, a pacemaker and a defibrillator in oral this last year. Fine woman who graduated from ORU, not, not from our medical school. She went, went there earlier. But she went got her medical training somewhere else. But we got we had three hundred and thirty three doctors and they're all over the world. Mm -hmm. And not only the doctors but the students. Everywhere you go, students are in business, they're in newspaper uh, work, they're in politics, they're in every everything, you name it. Pastors. Ministry, pastors, everything. But you know one of the things that has helped us is that you tried to get all of the African-American children that you could get to come to the school. And you know, having those young people there have helped us because uh, black people are loose. When they start to serve God, they're loose. They just, it doesn't bother them to raise their hands and praise the Lord, you know. They're just, they're loose in their worship. And it's loosened up the, the Caucasians, if you want to say it that way. They've loosened them up until our chapels are absolutely fabulous because we have such a mix of African Americans and Asians and <clears throat> Indians and Americans. Everything you can think of is in that chapel. And it has helped so much to have different nationalities come together to worship God. It, it, it's amazing when we go to chapel. I just, the spirit of God in there is just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to university, Oral and I go home now sometimes, and we go down and drive down on the campus, and we look at the buildings, and we say, did we really, did we really have a part in this? Did we really? It's just so amazing to see everything there and to think that we had a part in it. It's just hard to believe. Cause it's Why so did you two uh, transfer from another college and come to RU. Why? You were two young Methodist people. Why? In fact, you were on the football team on the university you were attending, and you, you transferred out. You know, the very things you described drew us, the Spirit of God, the combining of the academic with the spiritual. We had seen the academic and the athletic, which is the main thing of most universities. They have academics and they have some sports programs, and that varies with each area. But we had not seen putting it all together. And when I heard of it, it ignited in me. That's what I want. What good does it do to train your mind, get your body in shape, but your spirit's undeveloped? And I saw God's plan was put them all together. And spirit, soul, and body. Another thing was is that you had had an open vision of the calling of God in your life out on the football field, which that was so supernatural because you weren't raised around Pentecostal things, and so mm -hmm. you didn't know anything about a vision or a dream or the supernatural. So it was so unusual, and through that, it then gave you a dissatisfaction stirring of where you were and you felt this drawing but you didn't know where you were being drawn to until the ORU student came home who had known us and he said I, I want to talk to you and Bill Joe said well I want to talk to you and he said I thought where did that come from because 
I didn't know I wanted to talk to him. But then when they talked and how that he began to tell you about ORU and about the classes and how that at these classes that the teachers prayed with their students and and that was just such a phenomena to us. We'd never heard of anything like that. And so when you went to ORU, you didn't really know a lot about the Holy Spirit. You just knew you were being drawn there. And one girl even tried to talk you out of it, who was sincere, but she was sincerely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she, she just said, you know, they, they believe in miracles. They believe in divine healing and they speak with tongues. I didn't know even what she was talking about. I didn't know that was good or bad, either one. <laughs> he was so, it, you know, it just wasn't his upbringing. He had not heard I'd never been taught him. one way or the other on that. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit three weeks after I came to the campus, heard the chapels. And that fall, I came in January of 72, seven years after ORU had opened in 65. Then Sharon came that fall, and we both got in on the Holy Spirit in the now. First set of classes that you two taught together, yeah. sitting on the stage in Maybe Center, where we hold church services today. That's right. And we sat there, and it was so amazing hearing you describe how you may see me driving down the road, and it'll look like I'm talking to myself, but I'll be speaking in the Spirit <laughs> and interpreting back. That's right. And then Brother Roberts told about how he had walked that campus, had no clue how to build a university, and he prayed in tongues, prayed in the Spirit. Then he got the interpretation and God showed him how to build the buildings. That ignited in me. It, suddenly what had been veiled and cloaked in mystery, it made sense. God's Spirit dwells within you. When you pray in the Spirit and you pray for interpretation, you get in your mind what God has inside of you, and you get both of them. Was it fair that you received a call to preach, or did you have it before? When I was on the football field, that word came to me, go where I tell you to go, touch, speak to people what I tell you, and touch people with my love, and they will go into eternity. I came to the campus, and I started going to the Holy Spirit in the Now Library, which back then was called the Pentecostal Library, and I checked out tapes and listened to them on the dial access system. They had a recorder there. Back then it was reel to reel of different ministers, and I heard David Wilkerson preaching on the call of God, and I fell out of my chair onto my knees. As he said these words, he was speaking in some youth conference somewhere, and he said, there's coming a day where there will be a band of young people that will march across the earth and reap the end time harvest. Oh, praise God. And I said, Lord, I want to be a part of that group of young people. And of course, there are many others worldwide of all nations and ethnic groups. And he was seeing it in the spirit that the final harvest would not be lost. There would be a group that would answer the call and who would say yes. And that's where it began. Well, uh, did you have uh, any move of God in your spirit on campus about the great church that God has helped you and Sharon build in Tulsa called Victor Christian Center? No, while I was there, one of my classes had a requirement that we design a model church. And we had to take from books we had read, speakers we had heard, everything, and put it into one church. And I wrote that. Today we're living in <laughs> Isn't the reality that of that. It's amazing how God Was brought. that Dr. Fisher? That was Dr. Durasov. Dr. Durasov. Dr. Fisher uh, kept saying, if you're going to change America, you must build Real. Christian schools. He said, it, our young people, they may have a heart for God, they may want to serve God, but their minds get filled with evolution, with anti-God beliefs th that... They, they come to the place of age and they don't have the ability to take the leadership they should. He said, we've got to put the word in young people when they're children, protect their minds through those junior high and senior high years so that as they come into adulthood, they know 
God's plan and principle, and they can be great leaders, whether they're judges or mayors or businessmen, engineers or teachers. How, how many people do you estimate that uh, comes to Victor Christian Center on Sunday? We have seven to 8,000 that are with us on the weekends. But you have a much larger outreach in the greater Tulsa area. There's a lot of children that ride our buses on Saturdays, and then there's a Dream Center, uh, and then our Sidewalk Sunday Schools. There's about 13,000 people that are actually a part right, of the membership. And then you're involved, you, you build schools all over the world. Through the Bible school programs that we've helped establish, some uh, that connect with us and identify, there's over 160 of those in 50 nations. And you've been today. using Maybe Center, our athletic uh, facility, for how many years? We started in August of 1982. Oh my, that's a long time, isn't it? Long time. that. Thousands of people, and just Easter weekend, 2004, right at 20,000 people were there for the Easter weekend. Over the weekend, that's just wonderful. Services Did there was in the Navy Center. Was that a record? We were right at the record for the weekend, mm -hmm. yes. It's a harvest time for us. It is a harvest time, yes. Um, Oral and I sit here now at age 86, and I'll be 87 next week and talk about the things that God did back in our lives. And it, you know, it's hard to believe. It's really hard to believe that so many things have happened and so many lives have been touched. And we just praise God every day for what He has done and has given us a chance to be a part of it. Because some people sit, and as you used to preach, Billy Joe, and I've heard you preach this, some people live to buy a home to buy two cars, to buy a boat, to go to the lake when they want to, to buy a second home someplace for vacation, to raise their children, to live and to die, and that's it. I heard you preach that. That was the vision I had on the football field. The message. The open vision. And there's more to life than that. There's more to life. It's wonderful to have a boat if you if you like the water, which we don't. But if if and if to get around, you have to have two cars usually. It's good to have education, it's good to have children, it's good to have a home and all that. But there's so much more to life than that, than that, that people, so many, many people are not finding. And uh, living out here in California, we see it so much. People don't go to church in this area very much. It's like um, Joel Osteen said last week it was in his sermon. He had, you know, he filled up that big, wasn't the Astrodome, it was where the Astro Their new baseball pl team. players play and filled up that place. Team place. Yeah. And he, uh, I think it's baseball, honey, but anyway, it doesn't matter. But he had it filled up, and he always tells a little joke as he starts to preach. And he said, uh, a pastor saw one of his parishioners come to church one morning and he said to him, well, sir, I haven't seen you here a long time. In a long time, we're so glad to have you. He said, uh, well, I'm glad to come. I do get here once in a while, Pastor. He said, well, I don't believe I've seen you since last Easter. He said, you just come on Christmas and Easter. Is that right? He said, yes. He said, well, you should join the army of God and come all the time. He said, well, I'm in the silent. Which in the I, secret service. In the secret service. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are in the secret service out here, I guess. They don't go to church much. Well, you but, know, even talking about Joel, the Osteen children. They all to, graduated from Came Oral, to Oral Roberts five, University. Five of them came What's to Oral. What's happening in these churches, oh, many of amazing. them all across America. It's amazing. The uh, New York Times has just written a big story about him. It has the biggest church in America, 17,000 seats, and he packs it every Sunday morning. Isn't that amazing? Five graduated, and they have all of them in their church working, except one daughter and her husband who are passing another church somewhere else. And his brother Paul graduated from our medical school, and uh, when Joel became pastor, when his daddy died, what, two years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, Paul resigned uh, and came from medicine into the church directly to help his brother and now they're merging medicine prayer right there together, just 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 like we taught it to our you. What a story! Would you say a word about that, Brother Roberts? How God spoke to you about the merging of prayer and medicine? Because to me, there are many significant milestones: the 
the great healing crusades, the birthing of the university, but the concept of prayer and medicine has taken hold in our nation because of seeds that were planted back there in, I think it was the late 70s, that word came. Well, he let me know that, the, that our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. You're not your own, he said in 1 Corinthians 6. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And Jesus said, they that are sick need a physician. He also uh, taught us that the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So with the spirit praying and the medical doctors taking the things of the earth, plus the skill that they learned in their medical education and in, in their practice, we have what God has provided here on earth for this wonderful body of ours. David in the Bible says that we're wonderfully and fearfully made. Think about that you have a body, but you're not a body. You have a mind but you're not mental or a mind. You are a spirit made in the image of God. And as a spirit, you live in your body and you're connected together by your mind. And if you come only by prayer or if you come only by medicine, then there's a disjointment. You're not joined. You're not fully connected because all of it comes from God. You know that everything you eat comes out of the earth. And it has a lot of medicine in it to purify it from poisons. But likewise, everything in medicine comes out of the earth. And the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When God gave me the word that I was to join medicine and prayer and to build this great city of faith, a medical structure, and to bring medical doctors in who were baptized with the Holy Spirit and had this superior medical training and background and tell the people to, to come with their prayers and to come with, with, with their expectation that God had given medicine and surgery for them and have it all joined together, the healings, the cures could be much more often and much more complete. And when we had to close it, years later, the uh, head of the American Medical Association came down to Tulsa and he saw that I was dispirited and, and, and hurting in my heart. He called me off to himself and he said, Dr. Roberts, I, I know how you feel and I don't want you to feel that way because by what you've done in joining medicine and prayer here, you have forever changed medicine in the United States. And I said, how could that be, doctor? He said, because you have done it publicly, you did it on television, the whole nation watched, watched you doing it. And throughout the country, the medical doctors and the nurses have begun to look at the practice of medicine in a different way. And I can confirm that by the doctors, friends that I go to, and, and the surgeons. Every one of them tell me that they always pray before they treat a patient or before they do surgery. Every one of them. And several times I've said, well, how long? He said, you should know said we learned it as you taught it to us through the City of Faith on television. So I know that this thing is real and someday it'll happen again. It won't close. I obeyed God. I can't tell anybody why it finally had to close. It may have been because we didn't have sufficient money. I don't know what, but I know that I did what God told me to do. One day, he was telling the Lord, I'm, I'm just so, I'm so upset 
because I had to close the city of faith. Lord, why did you tell me to build it? And I built it just like you said. And then it had to close. I don't understand. And the Lord said, I am much more interested in ideas than I am in buildings. And he said, you got the idea out of merging medicine and prayer, which is what I wanted. So don't worry about the buildings. And then one day I was walking around the empty building, still hurt in my heart and calling on him what to do. And he said, I will do what I will do. And go back home because I'll do he said, what I will do. hold your head up. Oh, no, he said, hold your head up. And walk with a purpose. And walk with a purpose. That's right. For, for I will do what I will do. That's what he said. He was asking him, Lord, what are we going to do with these buildings? They're empty. And we have no medical school. And that's what the, when the Lord yeah. said. You go on, hold your head up, walk with a purpose. I will do what I will do. I've had a dream that uh, someday somebody who has... Millions upon millions upon millions of dollars will have to feel God touch their heart and call us and say, start the medical school again. I've dreamed of it. I've prayed about it. And I remember him saying, I'll do what I'll do. So be it. I think the word that you said is so helpful to, to others. The concept. The idea got in the earth, you know. Well, he certainly uh, taught me something when he when he said, "I'm, I'm more interested in the releasing of ideas than I am in brick and mortar." And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the idea of prayer and medicine being merged has been released, and that we had something to do with it. Certainly, you know, Brother Roberts. I was just going to say, I was in another hospital. Uh, some time after the City of Faith had, had closed. And this hospital in Tulsa had a brochure, a very beautiful brochure, and it was about, it had the scriptures, John 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all, excuse me, uh, Acts 10, 38, all that were oppressed of the devil, and that uh, God would use both prayer and medicine for those that would believe. And that, uh, hmm. it, amazingly... It looked like it, a brochure I out thought, of the city of faith. as I looked at that brochure, I said, I showed it to you, I think. No, it was I very impressive. I said, can impressive. you believe this? I said, this concept that Brother Roberts received, it has gone into the whole medical world. Articles begin to be written in your magazines like Reader's Digest and other magazines about how that prayer actually helped patients, uh, the ones that they did surveys, you know, the patients that didn't have prayer and the ones that did have prayer, and that it seems that prayer gave something extra. And so the medical world has been shaken. It has been influenced because God brought that concept through you. And, you know, so many Christian medical people now in the, in the, uh, medical world everywhere that we turn that I believe God did what he wanted through that and I want to say one more thing and that is Brother Roberts one of the concepts that God gave you over the years that has impacted the entire body of Christ and that is seed faith the teaching that God gave me in 1947 on the miracle of seed faith that uh, Sowing and reaping is what the Bible is all about. And Jesus is called the seed of David, the seed of Abraham, the seed of God. And whatever we do is the seed we sow, including our, our giving to God. And the Bible teaches giving and receiving, sowing and reaping, and sowing our seed and looking to God, our source, for him to multiply it back to us. That's what I call seed faith, and it, it is throughout the world today. It, it is, is. In, all, in so many churches. Yes. As you look back and reflect over these years, 
Are there words you would like to say to people that are summing up your life? What God did through you that could help someone that's just beginning to follow the Lord, that is choosing to follow Him, maybe a minister seeking to, to obey God? Well, I would say learn to plant your seed. Uh, everything I have done, I have counted as a seed I sowed to God. And through that, I have looked to God and not to man, looked to Him as my source. See here, some time ago, I had done some work for the Lord for a certain minister of the gospel. Something they had wanted me to do for many years. And we went to extraordinary lengths to get it done. The Bible says the worker, uh, the minister is worthy of his hire and uh, muzzle not the ox that treads out the corn. And they made the trip and we did the job that they wanted done for the Lord and their church. And uh, they uh, didn't do what other ministers have done, but bring a, a love offering to help us in our last days for, for our support. And uh, I sort of let it get to me. <laughs> and I was turning the corner here in the house, going toward the kitchen where Evelyn was, and the Lord spoke right out of the blue. He said, I have more money than that person does. <laughs> and it just lifted the burden off my heart, and I was laughing when I came into the kitchen. And you remember what I told you? Yes. <laughs> you said God has more money than that woman. And, and he was telling me it didn't make any difference. They're not my source. Go ahead and plant your seed. I'm the one that multiplies as the seed sown. And it just lifted a burden off my heart. Well, if you start looking toward people, you get disappointed every time. Because people let you down. Really, people are not supposed to carry the burden, uh, your burden anyway. The Lord's supposed to carry it. And uh, his shoulders are broad and he carries it. And he's, he's our, he's and really his purses our are deep. <laughs> Make God your source. God Amen. is the source. He's Plant your seed. Plant your seed. Expect, Expect a miracle. Expect a miracle harvest, really. And then what happens? Something. Something good is going to happen to you.